Hello and welcome to the Valley Today. I am your host, Janet Michael. It is Community Health Day. That is where every month we jump on a Zoom screen, usually with a physician or an administrator, a nurse, all types of people I have talked to over the last seven years with Valley Health. This is our community health partnership that we do with them every single month. Today, we are going to be talking with Dr. James Van Kirk. He is a board certified palliative care specialist and the medical director of Valley Health's palliative care program. Joining him is Dr. Jeff Harris. We're going to talk a little bit, I understand, about palliative care. You're going to educate me on what it is exactly. But then the big thing that we're going to spend some time talking about today, Dr. Van Kirk, is advanced care planning, because that's something everybody from the age of 18 should be thinking about and changing. I feel like sometimes we set it and forget it, and that's not always the smartest thing to do either. So thank you for coming to give me a bit of an education today. Thank you. We're delighted to be here. Let me start with palliative medicine is one of the newest specialties in medicine, and it's a term that's often misunderstood and sometimes uh, causes a lot of fear for people when they hear it. In palliative medicine, we work with people who have serious illness, potentially life-threatening, but oftentimes are still pursuing aggressive treatment options. Our job is to work with the patient and the family with a multidisciplinary team. We have social workers, we work with clergy, music therapy, different therapy services here in the hospital. And our goal is to try to minimize burdensome symptoms, help plan for what's coming down the road, what might be next, and help smooth the path for everybody involved, the patient and the family. How is palliative care different from, say, hospice care? This is something that is often confused. Hospice is one of the end stages of palliative medicine. Hospice is when a person has a terminal diagnosis and has now opted not to pursue any further life-prolonging therapies. They want to focus their care on comfort. They want to be at home or wherever home may be for them with a goal of making each day as good as possible for as long as that's going to be. And so certainly that is part of what we do in palliative medicine, but the vast majority of what we are doing is working with people upstream before they're getting into hospice care and trying to help them manage the symptoms of chemotherapy or manage pain control or tolerate their cardiac meds. And and so what we're working with are people that have very serious illness, but just trying to help them do better with that illness. I feel like sometimes people, when they're in it, they're only thinking about getting through the day or getting through the week and don't often realize the impact it's having on friends and family members and all of the other ways that some sort of illness like that can seep in to their lives. So being able to help them manage a lot of different things and the illness itself has got to be really helpful. Absolutely. I think that has a huge impact. One of the things that we work on when we talk about goals, what's going to come next, is called advanced care planning. And advanced care planning is where I think about what I may or may not want in my future, given different healthcare situations. And one of the most important things that we do in advanced care planning is to assign somebody to be our voice if we lose the ability to speak for ourselves. Complete a document called an advanced medical directive. And that's so important for all of us who are adults, as you already said, 18 and over, because if something like that happens, the additional stress that puts on a family to try to know, are we making the right choices? Are we doing the right things? And having this already clearly spelled out by the person is a huge gift to the rest of the family. We now have a a wonderful opportunity in this community with a group of healthcare providers, Dr. Harris is one of these, and I'm I'm going to let him speak to this, that are here as a wonderful resource to all of us. I appreciate that you have brought in this team of volunteered retired physicians, because while I have spoken to numerous attorneys over the years, I have friends who are estate planning attorneys and have talked about advanced care planning. Having someone in the medical profession have this conversation with you gives it a whole new dimension. It's a whole new level because we can't always even know what possible things could happen. 
until we actually talk to a physician who's been there and done that and can give us really solid advice. So, Dr. Harris, I'm really glad that you have decided to volunteer your time in this way. You're very kind, and it's a pleasure to have an opportunity to talk about it. The four of us in this group share two things. All of us spent our careers essentially practicing in the Winchester area and Winchester Medical Center, largely. And secondly, we all came out of that experience with a real interest in these advanced medical directives, also called living wills. So what we have done is approach Jim about the prospects of a sort of two-prong approach. First, we welcome every opportunity we can get to speak to area groups about the advanced directive and hopefully gain opportunities to speak to civic groups, church groups, and the like. Secondly, we hope that those patients, those people whom we speak to, who still remain uncertain about what they wish to do, uh, would take advantage of a second part of this, which is made possible by the generosity of the hospital. The hospital supports this endeavor. So they have provided us with some clerical help as also some meeting space. And what we would like to do is make available to anyone who would like to come in with his or her family members, another individual who will serve as a so-called medical agent to speak on this person's behalf and sort of between family and medical staff and sit down with us. uh, We block out a one hour block of time and we try to walk through the advanced directive. The one we use is called Five Wishes. Janet, it is more than that. When one is terribly ill, it's not merely cancer. It can be end-stage heart disease or pulmonary disease, but it's frightening. It is frightening for families, and there are a host of practical things people need to do, wills and the like. And so our hope is that the added benefit of walking through this with an individual in person is that it not only helps them complete the five wishes, and share it with their physician and share it with all their family members. But it's an opportunity to talk about all the other things in their mind, their family, faith, culture, pets, all the things they want to figure out how it fits into towards the end of life. They may wish to talk about finances or property, things that we can't help them with, but at least give them a chance and their family to have an honest conversation between all of them before health deteriorates any further. And lastly, most everyone at the end of life often uh, approaches something they dearly wish they could participate in. It could be a granddaughter's wedding. So getting the family saying, is there a way if we all pitch in to perhaps enable this person to attend that service? We hope that we can facilitate those conversations and help people be well-prepared and more comfortable and less anxious about this enormous transition. A lot of what I hear when people discuss this topic is their initial fear of even bringing it up. They may not even be in any type of a medical situation, but they, especially after I've done a few shows, people will come up to me and say, hey, I listen to your show. And I agree, we really need to do this, but I don't know how to tell my kids this is what I want to do. I don't know how to have this conversation with my parents. This is a really good opportunity for that objective third person to help everybody work through the emotions that are attached to it while still getting the decisions made that need to be made and addressed. That's exactly the case. And as you can imagine, there will be a number of people we anticipate with whom we speak, say, I've got three talks, for example, coming up before Seniors First, the Area Mm -hmm. Aging Committee. And I suspect it will be like some of our earlier ones where you will have people who will listen take the handouts home, we'll find completing it relatively easy, and that will be it. They will be reminded to give a copy of that document, again, to their physician, family members, and their medical agent. But there will also be a lot of people who are not comfortable with that and will like to sit down and take advantage of the time to talk. The four of us are volunteers. 
there's absolutely no charge for what we do. Secondly, the hospital is, again, volunteering the space and some clerical help. There is no charge from the hospital. So we hope people will take advantage of this. We hope it will prompt conversations that all of us probably think about when we're very ill. Are there things that we wish we had said? Are there things that we regret saying and would like to apologize for? Will sitting down with families perhaps stimulate difficult but essential conversations that no one ever years later wishes they had said something when they had failed to? Let's take a break. When we come back, I want to talk a little bit more about Five Wishes. It's very important, too, you mentioned, to give those copies to family members, but also to the hospital, because then it will follow you should you even move away or you're in an accident in another state. It's very important following through with making sure that paperwork is filed. Can we talk a little bit about some of those things in the next segment? Absolutely. We are on the screen today with Dr. James Van Kirk. He is a board certified palliative care specialist and the medical director of Valley Health's palliative care program. Joining him is Dr. Jeff Harris, retired Dr. Jeff Harris. He is working in the advanced planning uh, department volunteer team. We're going to give you a a fancy uh, title during the break, Dr. Harris. (laughs) We're going to come back and talk more with both of them in just a couple of minutes. Hey sisters, you know who it is. I'm Omar, a senior at Mountain Vista Governor's School. Together with environmental nonprofit Sustainability Matters, we're rebranding recycling. Keep it clean, honey. Your bottles and cans don't have to be spotless, but they should never have chunks of food still attached. Pizza boxes with bits of cheese or lots of grease can't be recycled either, though you can compost greasy boxes at your lovely home. For more on how we're rebranding recycling, look for hashtag rebranding recycling on Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok, or visit sustainabilitymatters.earth. Welcome back to the Valley today. I am your host, Janet Michael. It is Community Health Day. Every month we meet up with someone from Valley Health to talk about a wide variety of topics. Today we are talking about advanced care planning. So Dr. James Van Kirk is on the screen with me. He is a board certified palliative care specialist and the medical director at Valley Health's palliative care program. Joining him is Dr. Jeff Harris. Jeff is part of a group of volunteers that have advanced care conversations with people through Valley Health, but at no charge. Valley Health doesn't assess a fee. You don't assess a fee. And it is a very valuable service, I think, Dr. Harris, that you offer. And you've got a pretty good group of volunteer physicians that partner with you on this. I'm very fortunate to be spending this time with these three folks. Bill Halk was involved with oncology for his career in this community. Cyril Barch, an internal medicine specialist. Diane Walker held multiple roles as a nurse practitioner, including some 15 years ago, an extended period with the free clinic. But she's also been involved with hospice. And my role as a nephrologist and internist, I work with the end-stage renal disease population for my career here as well. So out of this, the four of us, as you might imagine, developed a real appreciation for the need for these advanced directives. You have a perspective that most people don't often have access to because we're looking at it from all these different angles, but we're not really thinking about it from a medical perspective where you, I would imagine, in the years of your practice, have seen a lot and seen a lot of things that maybe some of us wouldn't even imagine or could think would happen to us or a family member. So it really is a valuable perspective that you provide. The nature of what we chose to do, you unfortunately dealt with lots of people towards the end of their lives. And as we mentioned earlier, as we all know, it, it, it is frightening. There are so many things to think through. And by thinking them through in advance and thinking them through with your family, what it ends up doing is I think it also brings families closer. It gives people a time to air things they wish they could talk about, but they are nervous about or anxious about doing it. And in the end, it actually produces fewer disagreements among families. 
But I remember seeing goodness knows how many times as the family all converges because mother is so ill. The child that lives at the greatest distance wants everything done. The child who has been caring for mother and seeing what a difficult time she is having wishes less be done. And that can be a problem. But we hope these conversations with one of the four of us may help everyone move through this difficult period, make it a bit easier. And I think five wishes just allows people, the, the important part for the patient is that he or she have an opportunity to make it clear towards the end of life what they want done and equally important, what they don't want done. What we want is for the family and the medical team to understand what the person wants and doesn't want and adheres to his or her wishes. That can only happen if before this period, you have walked through this with family, put it down as a legal document, five wishes, and everyone has a copy and everyone understands what you wish done and what you wish not be done. Tell me a little bit about Five Wishes. How did it get started? Why is it something that Valley Health uses? It turns out that there are multiple forms uh, for these advanced directives all over the country. Valley Health chooses to use one called Five Wishes because a lot of the development was done by the American Bar Association's Commission on Aging and the Law. Additionally, I gather a lot of national experts on end-of-life care participated in drafting it. And equally important, the state of Virginia and West Virginia are two of uh, 42 states, plus the District of Columbia, which recognize it. So if one was ill in any one of those states, your wishes would still be honored on the basis of five wishes. And that's how it was selected. And Valley Health keeps that on file. I touched on this before we went to break. Once you've gone through and you've filled out all the forms, and you've done everything that you wanted to have done, you've made your decisions, family members get a copy, but it's very important to file that copy with your local hospital in particular and your primary care physician so that it can follow you across those 42 states. Absolutely. And the most important person is the person that you choose to be your agent or the people. They need to have it. it it's not going to do you any good in a lockbox somewhere else. And in Valley Health, we get somebody's advanced directive and it immediately goes into their computer as medical record. Even if they don't have one, they will start one for the person with their advanced directive in it. There are some things too, I understand, Dr. Harris, that your group can't do. So I don't want people coming into this with expectations that you're going to be able to help them change their will, for example. There are some things that are out of the purview of what these conversations can provide to a family. Absolutely. And we want people to have realistic expectations. There are essentially three things we cannot do. One, we can't prescribe for them and, and we cannot alter their care. That has to be done by the group of healthcare providers who are managing the case. Secondly, uh, we cannot advise them on state issues or their last will and testament. They need to speak to an attorney about that. And lastly, uh, we cannot write a do not resuscitate order that has to be written by their primary care physician or the physician who is managing their case. But that is one of the things that they should be having the conversation about. They should be sitting there with their family talking about whether they want one of those or not. And then you can give them advice on both sides, explain why it may or may not be helpful or necessary. You can help them make that decision. You simply can't create the document and then make it a legal document for their primary care physician to abide by. At the end of this conversation, all four of us will essentially end it in the same way. Once they have signed it in front of the family, we again remind them, please, everyone gets a copy, but your physician gets a copy as well, and your medical agent does too. We remind them to have conversations with their attorney about any of these issues that come up. You can't put those things off to the last minute, but get good advice 
we also write a note to their physician and say, we just had a conversation with Mr. So-and-so and he signed this and he will be bringing you a copy. And he is particularly concerned about a type of treatment you're providing. He and his family have misgivings. We've explained that we cannot alter that, but we've encouraged them to come talk to you about it. Which is incredibly helpful, I think. Hopefully. Dr. Van Kirk, we've been talking a lot about this from the perspective of a health diagnosis of some sort, whether it's a heart associated illness or cancer or something along those lines. You and I have had conversations in the past where that doesn't even have to be a precursor. It shouldn't be a precursor. The minute someone is 18 years old, this is something they should be thinking of. I think one of the the weaknesses is that we all tend to think we don't need to worry about this until we have some kind of major health diagnosis. The reason we have these laws are because of really unfortunate things that happen to young people. They were mostly car accidents. All adults need to have at least an agent, a medical agent appointed so that if something happens to them, they have somebody that has their back. In my house on a kid's 18th birthday, they fill out an advanced medical directive appointing a medical agent. And there have been communities like La Crosse, Wisconsin, with the Gunderson Health System Project, where they've had completion rates over 90% of their adult population. In Virginia and the Winchester area, we're averaging around 20%. What? But we can do certainly much, much better. And I think people were worried, oh, this means that I'm going to die. No, it means that if something happens, you've got your back covered by somebody that you trust to make your decisions. And we've talked also in in other conversations, too, that you don't want to not choose that person and then have that be a burden on your family. You want to be able to give it all of the consideration that you need. Choose the person so that then the kids aren't saying you do it. No, you do it. I don't want to be responsible for that. And now they're stressed and they're worried while they're also concerned about the health of a friend or a family member. So being able to make that decision ahead of time and be comfortable with it is a huge benefit. You're doing such a good thing for your family. Absolutely. And some people choose to choose a best friend and not a family member for that very reason. You need to communicate and let everybody know what's going on. But some people have said, I don't want to put this burden on my family and I'm going to choose this other person whom I trust and I've spoken with. And again, that can be a tremendous gift to a family that's going through incredible difficulties. It's also not something that you want to then lock away in a box. At age 18, a lot happens over the course of your lifetime. So you really do need to take a look at it every now and then. National Healthcare Decisions Day is always the day after tax day. So it's April 16th. We say that on April 15th, you take care of the government. And on April 16th, you take care of yourself. And so every April 16th, you should pull out your documents, whether it's a will, a medical advance directive, whatever, but you should pull out your documents and just check them and make sure. I had one that I was embarrassed. It took me two years because I wasn't doing that well to realize that my agent had died and couldn't serve as my agent any longer. And I had to update my document. So April 16th, take care of yourselves. Dr. Harris, you made a good point during the break in that none of us ever know what tomorrow is going to bring. It could be something as sudden as a car accident, but you could be the picture perfect of health and then suddenly something on a scan show up a little wonky. Maybe it turns out to be nothing, but this really is something that you can take care of now and really know that it's taken care of. So it's one less worry that you might have moving forward. Well, you're certainly right. And many people in your audience will probably remember Nancy Cruzan, a young woman who was thrown from a car in an auto accident, had irreversible brain injury, but was a source of a pitted legal struggle uh, with the state when her parents asked that life support be discontinued and allowed to die. And it went all the way to the Supreme Court before a decision was made. But the heartbreaking part of that case, which ultimately led to advanced directives of the law that brought it about, was that this young woman, because it was unsettled, she laid essentially in a hospital bed with an NG tube 
in a vegetative state, unresponsive, for seven years wow. before this was resolved. But Congress has passed a law now that makes it possible to do what we've been talking about. And I, I don't know where this will ultimately go. We are few in number, the four of us, and we hope to garner lots of chances to speak in the communities. But you can envision, uh, Jim was just talking about his kids who 18. You could envision approaching, say, Shenandoah University, where those youngsters are that age, and speak to them. It has to be thought out carefully because of their age. But on one hand, it might remind them that they are not immortal. Just filling out this form is a sort of indelible reminder that life is finite. On the other hand, it, it may be too mortal. I just don't know. But there are lots of opportunities, and we have to obviously think it through and do it in collaboration with lots of folks before taking any bigger steps. So we're starting off with sort of baby steps, but we hope we'll accomplish something worthwhile. How can people make an appointment? How do they have a conversation with you? What is the best first step for them to take? Again, fortunately, the hospital has made this space and personnel available to us. And all they need do is call this number, 540-536-5437, which is the office here at Palliative Care. Voice an interest in, again, speaking to one of the four of us and give us a time and date that is convenient for the individual and his or her family and medical agent. And we will try to work it out with one of the four of us. We will book one hour and meet you here and chat if that is insufficient time. But you or the family members, we will book another hour. Thank you for the work that you're doing. I feel like it's something I'm a little shocked, but it, we're at 20 percent. You and I are going to have to do a campaign or something, Dr. Van Kirk, and try and get that at least to 60. Come on. <laughs> Thank you both for taking some time today. I appreciate it. Thank you, Janet. Thank you for the opportunity. I will be back tomorrow. We're talking 4-H tomorrow with extension agents from the surrounding counties. So that's going to be fun. Meet me back here for that a few minutes afternoon.